Uh, evening, guys. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so uh, my name is Challenge or Chalenge. I change it depending on who I'm talking to. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I'm a data scientist for Salesforce Einstein, so I'm going to be talking about some of the work we're doing. Uh, first, I would like to thank Daniel for like inviting me to sort of share like what we're working on. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. Uh, guys at the back, can you hear me? My voice projection sometimes. Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, my favorite slide as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about some of the things that we're working on. So you know the drill. Please make purchasing decisions on something that's already there. And luckily, we have something for Einstein, which is GA, which went out in the last release. So that's great. Um, yeah, so first of all, I would like to thank you guys for coming. I think uh, the developer network is, some, is a great component of Salesforce and makes our product better. And for that, I'll thank you. Yeah, so uh, a bit of my uh, background about myself. Um, I do data science at Einstein. Um, before that, I did uh, information management and systems at Berkeley. Uh, surprisingly, one of my classmates came to my talk. Uh, by surprise, Toshiro at the back. We just the, then before that, I did uh, business intelligence consultancy, um, which was sort of like uh, my gateway into data science. And I did that whilst I was in Zimbabwe. That's where I'm originally from. Um, yeah, so the agenda for today. First, um, hopefully some, uh, first we're going to talk about like Einstein one on one. Uh, hopefully all of you have seen some of the slides I'm going to show. But uh, it's sort of like just like to describe what is AI for those of you who like still try to struggle, like understand like what is it, uh, uh, artificial intelligence and data science and like sort of like what are the problems with it and like how it's done. Then the second thing we're going to talk about like uh, what are the sort of like the issues with data science for a multi-tenant uh, software as a service provider like Salesforce and why it is sort of like taking time for us to get here. Uh, then thirdly, I'm going to talk about like, um, like sort of like an overview of like the automated uh, machine learning services architecture, uh, which, we are hop which we are working on and like uh, build out, so that which sort of like explains how we want to automate machine learning so that everybody can be able to do data science. Then uh, the fourth thing, I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into sort of like uh, the platform that we're working on um, and like what are some of the components and like what exactly that to do uh, automated machine learning. Yeah, so uh, the first uh, AI 101. Uh, so like AI data science, there are three things that I, uh, which like sort of like the key things. The first is uh, what are called responses. A response or a prediction or a label, it's something that you want to predict. Let's say you have um, a text classification problem. You want to predict the next text. Uh, you have a sales object, you want to predict the likelihood of that person to like convert into a lead. Then the second thing are what are called predictors or features. So for every like machine learning problem, um, predictors or features are the object, are the factors that are likely that correlate to the response that you're trying to predict. So for example, you have a sales object, you have the name of the person, where they work from, where they live, uh, what job title they have. All of those things have some correlation with whatever you're trying to predict, whether is it the ability of that person to convert or like uh, not convert, or the amount of money you might make from that person. Then the third thing uh, is what's called a model. So a model is um, just like any like model. It mimics a real world like uh, situation. So uh, in machine learning, uh, models are like, uh, could be statistical. And nowadays we have more like computer science type of more, uh, what you call modems which are the ones which sort of like bring in the two together. A model like um, uh, relates the predictors, the features that we have to the response that we, uh, that you were trying to predict. So it could be as simple as like a simple equation like y is equal to a plus b, where y is the, uh, the response that you're trying to predict and a could be the coefficient of let's say somebody's age, then x could be some other factor which could be like uh, their job title. So once you have all those three things, uh, you have your uh, responses, you build out a machine learning uh, model. Uh, have, there are many kinds of them, like uh, the buzzwords like uh, deep learning, neural nets, um, to simple ones like uh, uh, random forests or even just like decision trees, uh, which could be just a simple uh, if statement where like, if somebody 
works for Salesforce, they will convert. Or if not, they work for this other company and they have this title, they're going to convert. So that's sort of like what a model is. So uh, this is another, uh, this is a, uh, another slide which uh, sort of like was shared at Dreamforce. But um, I hope some of you guys saw it. But like, uh, it's sort of like for me, it's a good uh, slide. Because there are three things. Every, like uh, right, right now, um, AI and machine learning is a big thing. But like for most companies, like uh, doing AI is pretty complex. Um, when I was in Zimbabwe, like uh, I did business intelligence. And when we started trying to move, we're like, oh yeah, we have this data, like business intelligence is like, oh, predict, uh, it's more historical. We had so many sales, but in this world, like you need to be on the next step. You wanna be able to know like, what's gonna happen next? How many sales are we gonna have um, in the next quarter? Uh, which people are gonna leave my service? But then trying to do that is pretty hard, especially for most companies because of a multiple reasons. Um, first, uh, this is like sort of hidden complexity, just like understanding the machine learning problems, uh, like what a model is and like what's the best one is hard. Then the second one, um, I think if you have tried to do machine learning, that's where most of you are like sort of like your work go, like data preparation and integration at scale. Being able to build a pipeline which will like, let's say, uh, ingest data from like your data sources and be able to like uh, put it in a scalable production model and keep doing it at scale every day or every hour or every second. That's, uh, it's a very uh, big problem. Then the other, uh, the, uh, the third thing is like um, the actual modeling and data science. Uh, for a lot of us, um, even for myself when I started like I had no idea what data science is, but like my boss was like, oh yeah, when I do machine learning, when I do data science, can you come up with a model? I'm like, I don't know what that is. And like, um, so like a lot of us, like um, it's something that's just like started uh, recently. So either like we don't have enough education or like just like being able to understand what it is and being able to do it in, in the best practice is hard. Then uh, the fourth problem is like infrastructure. Uh, so. Uh, right now, like, uh, we live in a um, tech world, like, there's so many data points um, from social media, even the number of, like, uh, uh, transactions our business systems are having. Being able to build infrastructure that keeps scaling and, uh, like, um, that keeps scaling and able to, like, uh, build models and, like, ingest data is pretty hard. So it adds another different complexity because, like, in an ideal world, you just want to be able to, like, get data, build your model, then like get predictions. But then once you want to do that at scale and even at production, you have to worry about the infrastructure. Then also um, context. Uh, from my like um, uh, uh, sort of like how I've worked, um, what I've seen is like uh, people are able to do, some people are able to do data science, but being able to put the context and make it be productive and useful to the business. It's nice to have models, but like if they don't give value to you or give value to your customers, then there's no point. So uh, this, uh, the elevator pitch for Salesforce Einstein, uh, it's two main points. Like Salesforce Einstein is artificial intelligence for everyone. Um, it's uh, data science embedded into the Salesforce platform and it's your personal data scientist. Then uh, the second uh, bullet, which for me like relates closely to me is like enabling everybody to be able to build uh, AI powered apps using clicks or code want to democratize data science. We don't, uh, we want you to be able to do data science or be able to build products or uh, have the benefit of data science without a PhD in machine learning. So uh, what we are working on is trying to build uh, the world's smartest CRM. Hopefully some of you guys have seen this slide. Uh, we are trying, uh, as I said, like embedding artificial intelligence into every cloud or every product of Salesforce from sales cloud, Einstein, predictive lead scoring, uh, service cloud re recommendation, uh, cl case classification, then app cloud, which is like um, Heroku plus uh, prediction IO. Then all the, every cloud in Salesforce, so every product, uh, we're gonna embed like uh, in artificial intelligence and data science. So like uh, over the past year, Salesforce has been doing a lot of like data science uh, acquisitions from Beyond Core, Implicit Temple, prediction <laughs> IO, Relate IQ, and uh, Edge Spring. Yeah, oh, so yeah, the next thing, uh, now I'm gonna talk about like what are the issues for, data science issues for machine, uh, in a multi-tenant 
uh, environment. So if you want to build a machine learning or you want to do a machine learning problem, uh, it's usually what's, what I would call a typical machine learning problem, like people who work in data science, it's sort of like, focus, it's like something like this. Let's say Amazon, they want to predict uh, what you would like to purchase next. So it's usually focused on one business uh, process. You know how p the users of that project uh, or like that platform or your product have a similar journey. You go on Amazon, you click stuff that you, you added to a cart, you look at stuff, you read reviews, then you either buy them or you don't. Um, so with that, we can sort of like be able to build a sort of like a finite feature set. We know, we can sort of like have data points and uh, that we know like if uh, we can they say, the things that they click, um, how, how much time they're gonna be on the service, etc. Which makes it sort of like easy. You can sort of like envision like, oh yeah, this is how somebody moves and like these are some of the things that we can sort of track to be able to build our feature set. So um, this um, uh, is what's traditionally called the methodo methodology for building machine learning apps. It's called uh, CRISPDM. Um, so it sort of like highlights the steps that you would need to do to sort of like build a successful machine learning problem, a machine learning app. First, uh, you need, as I said, context. You need to be able to understand what the business is. And the second is like building those pipelines for data uh, to sort of like track uh, whatever metrics you need that are associated to the business problem that you want to solve. Once you have uh, sort of like uh, some data understanding, then you do data preparation, pulling data from multiple sources into like a warehouse or a data lake or something like that. Then once you have the data, you can actually then start modeling. Um, here it sort of like says modeling is one blocks, but like there's like multiple steps to that, which I shall show in, the, uh, in later slides. Then once you have done your modeling, you have a model that's working, you do evaluation, you test how well is this model doing in terms of predicting um, uh, what I wanna solve. Once you're satisfied with that, then you deploy it. And it's sort of like an iterative step. A lot of the, like, um, when you do machine learning, it's sort of like once you have a model that's working, you go back and say, is this model performing well? Is there, uh, does it solve the business problem and to what extent? Do we need to look for more data? Do we need to go back and like uh, do more data preparation? Do we need to f uh, figure out if we can do better models? Do we need to tune the data in certain ways? And keep do so it's sort of like you keep doing that forever. So um, then, so it seems like it, then it ends up being a bit misleading that you seem to spend like similar amount of time on each of one of those. But like uh, the data preparation and modeling is where like most of the time um, is spent. So for Salesforce, we can't do that um, model that I've shown. Firstly, because of privacy concern. Like um, as I highlight, like in terms of like um, in a typical machine learning app, Amazon or like even LinkedIn, they, you have the same users and you can sort of like predict what they're gonna do. And it, it's like sort of like there's a consumer good. But like in Salesforce, we have multiple companies. You can't cross pollinate their data and build like one generic model. Uh, then the second thing is like the business uses cases are totally different. Uh, how a hotelier uses like Salesforce is different from like, how a bookshop would use Salesforce. So you, uh, for you to be able to build a model which is really successful, you need to like factor in that and build a model which is tuned to the specific needs uh, or, or the business case of the user. Then uh, another big problem is like uh, platform customization. It's great that we can like uh, customize Salesforce, we can add all these uh, custom objects. But in terms of like from a machine learning uh, perspective, it gives a headache because like uh, you don't know which, co or which sort of like uh, features to use and the feature set becomes totally infinitely large that you can't either like try and check each single one of them if they work or like they're co related to what you are trying to predict. Then the other thing is like scale and automation. Uh, we need to be able to create like m all these things at scale every single day or every single hour. So like this is how the process would look like for Salesforce uh, in a typical use case. Like we want to build lead, uh, what you call it, uh, lead scoring or like um, for Uber. 
uh, we'll have to do it again for what you call it, for Aka and Timberland. And usually you have like a team of data scientists associated to each one of those processes. So even if we hired like all the data scientists in the world, we wouldn't be able to deliver all the, uh, what you call it, machine learning uh, functionality that we want to deliver in terms of like across all the products. So we had to like sort of like uh, rethink of like how can we do data science uh, which is where we sort of like come with this, uh, what we call like metadata science, sort of like teaching computers how to do data science. So what we want, uh, it says like what we want to achieve, but like uh, uh, what we've sort of been building towards is like, uh, uh, given this data set, like uh, it's called, it's the Titanic data set, it's a uh, uh, famous like uh, machine learning data set like uh, so the Titanic uh, data set is like um, it, it uh, the problem is like given if you know, with all the people who were on the Titanic you'd want to predict who survived based on either with the cabin they were their age and stuff like that so it seems like a very simple problem if you look at it like it's just like the 13 uh, columns and like one response then they're just, there's like enough data, it's like a thousand passengers, uh, a thousand three hundred passengers who went there. So in terms of like, a, what would, s if you are like uh, n new to machine learning, you'll be like, oh yeah, this is easy. I have very few uh, features that I can use. I have sufficiently enough, uh, sufficiently large number of data to train my model in. But then if you actually try and do it, you'll see that like it's pretty hard and you never, you for you to get to a very successful model which is able to predict with reasonable accuracy, you go through a lot. But what we wanted to do is like, let's say any one of you guys wants, who is interested in machine learning, they're given this data set, either through like a CLI command and say, Einstein, give, point to this data, predict the column survives, we do some <coughs> magic and it spits out like a, the prediction. So that's sort of like the vision and the product that you are working on. You just uh, either you feed in data, click on a column that you want to predict, we do some magic for you at the back end and we give you predictions. So how we sort of like thought of it, uh, we have like sort of like two ways we've been doing about it. First, um, my team, uh, we have like Apache Prediction IO. Uh, which is a company which joined my team uh, about roughly a year ago. Yeah, in fact, almost a year ago to this day. So uh, uh, Apache Prediction IO is an open source machine learning server for developers and data science to create predictive engines. So um, with that, they have like a template gallery, which is like old, sort of like the traditional machine learning problems. If you wanna build a recommendation engine, you don't have to do anything. They have already have a gallery. You just like say, you just like select it and you feed in data. Then they'll start like creating models or training engines for you. That will give you some reasonably good accuracy. So they have like uh, uh, engines across from uh, recommendation, classification, regression, NLP, and even uh, clustering. So which is sort of like a, a good thing. Uh, then the second part is like uh, the Einstein platform, which I'm working on. Uh, uh, w uh, which is more, we've been working it more internally, but w we're now starting to sort of like figure out how we can build it out to developers. Um, but like what uh, we wanted to do is like uh, some, something sort of similar to prediction IO, but like in with internal sales source products, like be able to, let's say any cloud, let's say uh, app cloud, they have data, they wanna predict, uh, they wanna start building machine learning problems they don't have to worry about the infrastructure. They don't have to worry about like doing all the ETLs. All they have to do is like sort of like point to their data sets and we sort of like start automating the process of like of doing the ETLs, doing some of the feature engineering. So how we've been able to do this is using a, a bunch of like uh, all these technologies like Amazon, Arca and Spark and Scala and uh, even Git to build what we sort of call uh, Optimus Prime. That's like our internal code, code name for it. Um, um, so like the overview of what this would look like is like, uh, let's say even for an internal or external developer, we, you have a CLI, you have a web UI, you have an exploration tool. 
you do some, uh, you do some uh, configuration, we have the data puller, the data preparator, the data store, data pusher, and a monitoring and scoring service all wrapped in inside like to create um, sort of like this engine for you, which will then have like a controlling system which will like figure out like when should we schedule data pools, when should we schedule training of new jobs, when should we like, uh, how should we ma manage models? Let's say you've built your machine learning model, it's working, you want to experiment with a new one, how do we manage all those models so that you can easily like just like roll back when you have like a, something new. So uh, maybe some like why we chose some of these technologies like um, especially like uh, Spark is like uh, Spark is like one of the great tools that are out there. Uh, it's like the industry side for like general uh, data processing. And it's also uh, internally we use Scala, we love Scala. It's easy. Um, one of the big reasons it's type safe and like Python. Uh, so it's sort of like Java, but it's less verbose, which means you're yeah, productive. You're able, you don't like write 300 lines to do something you could achieve in like 50 or less. Then we also do, uh, we use uh, what's called ACA. It's like a toolkit for runtime building, high, high concurrent, um, distributed, but resilient uh, message driven applications on the JVM. Why we wanted to do that? Like, because we wanted to like build all these microservices that are sort of like independent to each other that they can like self heal and be able to like keep scaling without having for us to consider worry about JVM issues. So now uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about like uh, sort of like how we've sort of like been doing uh, the automated ML using the Einstein platform. So overall, uh, this is sort of like uh, the overview of how move in how things would move uh, in the Einstein platform. First, um, uh, we have feature extraction, sort of like jobs or like um, classes that are like are in charge of like data reading, feature aggregations. Then once we have that, we have we move to what's called the transformation plan. Uh, then w we do some transformations on the data uh, so that it's more. Uh, um, it's more better suited for machine learning. Then once we have that, we do uh, model selection. Once we, uh, model selection where we uh, try different models, figure out like uh, which one works best, do some sanity checks that we're just like not spitting out random, um, random numbers or like random predictions. Then we actually fit the model and we write it out either th uh, through an API or to wherever um, the requested resource is. So yeah, so the first thing, uh, um, I'm not gonna talk a bit about like uh, the, the data preparation, it's pretty standard ETL, you get data, pipe it, pipe it through some service, you get it to a data store, a data lake, then you keep it there. So I'm gonna set it like uh, the second, uh, f um, the second uh, stage, which is the, uh, the transformation plan. So if you are doing data science, feature engineering, uh, Remember, if we go back to that uh, initial Chris uh, diagram that I showed, it's sort of like highlighted everything as equal. But like once you do data science, like m this part of modeling and feature engineering is like where you spend most of your time on. So like if you want to do data science, it would be very important for you to be able to at least automate some part of it. So we have been um, quite successful with doing some of this. So. Our feature engineering is like feature extraction, which is like being able to pull data, understanding what the data type is, and like what are some of the transformations that we can do on that data. Mm, I'll talk a bit, a bit more about it later. Then sort of like feature classification and uh, feature selection. So uh, being able to choose uh, the right features usually gives you better performance than the machine learning algorithm you're gonna choose. So if that's so, if you are able to uh, select the right features, do the right transformation, you're gonna get most of your gains, probably like 75. Then the rest, maybe 15, are gonna come from the type of model you're gonna choose. So how we do like feature engineering? We have like what's called a feature builder. So this allows us to like sort of like uh, remember in Salesforce we have multiple infinite. Mm, uh, numbers of uh, features and like objects that people can create. So we want to be able to like given a feature of specific type without even knowing what the name is, B 
be able to do some extraction, extractions on it, be able to sort of like figure out like what's the uh, aggregation function we need to do on that. Um, so how we do that, we have like what's called a feature builder, which sort of like maps uh, sort of each specific, uh, you have a question? Uh, th it's sort of like both. Oh, yeah. Oh, he was asking like if I'm um, if uh, I'm talking about uh, features that will be available to developers or just internally. So yeah, uh, if, uh, if if you go back to what I said, like uh, we are not f um, we want everybody, even the developers, uh, to be able to use uh, some of these features. Something like that, but yeah. So like actually, like uh, I just like before when I talked to Daniel, I was working more on the control part. But like now, I'm working more towards what's gonna be called the prediction service. It's sort of like uh, it's gonna be a mix of both. But like ideally, if we build something that just like stays within Salesforce, it doesn't help us anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, so then, uh, so the second part is like feature classification, being able to like classify like age, is it a double, or like is it a numeric feature? Is it um, and like passenger, what type of like a feature is it and like how we can do? Then sort of like uh, doing like vowel survived, which is like being able to understand what is the prediction that we want to do. Uh, then the next part like uh, feature transformation. So remember I said like we call it internally optimized prime, primarily because of this reason, because like all it does is most of what it does is just transformations. Gets data, does some specific transformation. So um, we do some like uh, missing value computation. Let's say uh, a company has a set of leads. Some of them don't have specific um, attributes. Let's say the age or like the company they are working on. We should be able to do, understand like uh, how do we fill in those missing values? Do we just dump them? Or do we, what, what are the smart ways of like handling them? Uh, also like there's something called binning, let's say for usually for numerical values like age. Uh, sometimes instead of just like using the age per se, you can group it and say people from zero to 10, 20 to 25. Then uh, another thing is called interactions, being able to provide a way of saying you can combine features, somebody's age, and their sex could be more predictive than just like each one of them. Uh, so yeah, so this is just like uh, showing like how we we'll do that. It's sort of like a, mm, you get something you can say age to transform using this sort of transformer. Uh, Fill the mean using this sort of transformer. Uh, and we can do the same thing for like uh, smart binning and s uh, uh, normalization. So uh, normalization is like uh, usually you have a range of numbers. Uh, so instead of like, uh, w and you have outliers, probably you find somebody whose age is 100. So instead of just using it, you can sort of like uh, do uh, statistical normalization so that it's better predictive. Uh, then, yeah, this is more uh, uh, interaction as well, just like being allowing people to be able to do, to combine things, to be, to predict, be, uh, to make pre better predictors. Then uh, model selection. So um, there's like this great like sort of like um, uh, cheat sheet and, uh, which can sort of like, so remember like uh, w we said given data, we wanna be able to, and somebody says predict this. So we needed sort of like think of a way of s figuring out like what type of problem is it? Cause like uh, the type of problems are different. Um, we have like what's called classification, either putting somebody as either an A or in like, let's say, uh, or just a normal use case, like uh, we have a bunch of salespeople, you can just classify as then this will convert, this one will not. So we had to like sort of think of ways we can sort of like uh, 
look at the data and be able to understand like what are the typical uh, what you call it machine learning algorithms that you can apply to that. Then we also you then you can sort of like start thinking of like uh, what's the frequency of the event uh, that you're trying to predict, what's the data sample size, uh, distribution, then uh, what's called label leakage, where some of the thing, let's say somebody says we want to predict uh, if something will convert, but you also have another column which is closely related or like mirrors that exactly. So without being smart about it, you will use that column and it will be like very mm, closely related. Yeah. Well, so this, this is your Titanic example. Yes. So what if you would have to take into account in at least that time period that it was always women and children went first. So how would your model account for that? Would the age bracketing somehow take care of that? Or? Uh, it's a combination of multiple things. So yeah, so the question was like, uh, given like the example Titanic model that we're talking about, like uh, um, most likely children and um, women would go first. So that would sort of be more, more likely to be correlated with the response. I would like, uh, this would sort of put in, in, so yeah, so I'm saying it's a combination of things. Well, um, Yeah, so like, what, uh, I can go back a bit. Um, oh yeah, actually it's um, right here. In terms of label leakage, so there are multiple methods um, we can, that we, do in, we use internally, which say this feature has this uh, very close resemblance. Let's say mm, close to, if it's uh, from a statistical point of view, one-to-one -one correlation with uh, what you call it, with what you're trying to predict, then we should not use that feature. Because like, all it's gonna do is just like add noise. Noise is just like you have, uh, you're adding features that don't really help you. So we have multiple techniques, which uh, if you want, I can like sort of like go through you, like how we sort of like figure out like these sort of features uh, are not really useful for what you are trying to predict, which is what's called label leakage. I'm sorry, what's that called? Label leakage. Label leakage. Oh. Yeah. So yeah, then like, so now once we sort of like know what we are trying to predict, we can sort of like have a simple interface which says, I, which can sort of like take in whatever machine learning uh, algorithm. The goal being like, let's say in the future you build your own machine learning algorithm which is amazing, and you don't want to use like the standard ones, you should be able to sort of like bring it into the platform and be able to apply it and use that instead of the using the ones that we already provide. Sorry, so just to clarify, so you, you would, you would uh, uh, you are hoping, what you are hoping to achieve is that the users would be, would be able to run the, your own uh, algorithm, a finished algorithm, and say, and given the same data set, say, yeah, we should, who would survive on the Titanic? But also, you, they, you would give the building blocks for that algorithm so that they, they could build their own. They can, like, expand it and make it better. <laughs> depend. Yeah, it, it's actually something that we've been working on, like, let's say you have a best model, you can, if you have, so let's say you're very, you're machine learning savvy, you can just, like, expand that model build it, import it into like the, the platform and be able to use that. Th which also brings in the model management so that you can sort of like say, I've tried this one, it's not working, let's use the old one or like, so that you can keep iterating just like how you do like, let's say uh, web development. The, the predictive vision service gives you some default models. Yes. I was also planning on doing that for the other services that are provided because not everybody has the data at their disposal that they want to use. So Sales was planning on providing some default models for our use directly. So right now what's available is uh, what I said, talked about like the prediction, the prediction I want, mm -hmm. that's like out there, you can just like use it. There's like all the templates that you can use for almost every, but this one was still, uh, what I can say is like, I, I can't say we're gonna give you all the models, but like it's sort of like, we're st still trying to figure out like how, what's the best, in fact, we've made some steps in figuring out what's the best way to provide a list 
the base start for you to begin AI and building your own models and also enable you to like make changes or like build your own models and import them inside. Uh, that's a question that I have no idea. I don't know if w which platform is gonna take that. Um, I can't. I can't. I haven't. The classic, um, yeah. yeah no. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. The question. Uh, the question is like: uh, Is um, this gonna be available on Lightning or, or Classic? Uh, and my response is like: um, I. I can't comment on that. I'm not sure. It's not available now. It's not available now. It's something that we're working on. And should be. Yeah. yeah. You made it available in Lightning only, it would help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking that one to the board. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so sort of like just like hi uh, reiterating the, what you call it, the sanity checking that you're talking about, as in like, how, what's the best way to sort of like ensure that whatever we have or whatever somebody puts in in their data set is not uh, is not going to corrupt the model, or is not going to be closely related and doesn't really help them. So we can sort of like have bad features, and we have like sim we can like have uh, we can have like sort of like base uh, <coughs> transformers, which you can also like extend, which you will be able to extend to like sort of like build better stuff. Then uh, another step is like what's called uh, resampling, being able to let's say uh, a typical machine learning problem is like somebody wants to do AI, let's say I want to predict um, people are going to buy uh, a certain product, but you only had like out of a hundred, you only had like let's say two have bought it. So in, in terms of machine learning for the uh, machine to learn like without enough data points, <coughs> it's not going to be really smart. So one of the things that we've been working on is like sort of like being automated, like resampling, let's say, Instead of just having um, 100, um, let's say 100 data points, it can easily predict. If say, let's say, so let's uh, the example is like we have 100 data points and only one reflects your what you call it, what uh, the success case. If your model predicts all of them wrong, yeah, the next 100 wrong, it's gonna work with like it's gonna give you 99% accuracy. But like. If we train it and if we give it another hundred like uh, data points, it's also going to keep predicting that for uh, uh, all of them are not going to convert, but with 99% accuracy. But it doesn't really help you. What you want to be able to do is figure out like tune your model, like tune your whatever workflow you build, so that it learns that one special case and be able to predict it uh, correctly. So you can sort of like uh, uh, through a config be able to say. How do I, um, my sampling rate is like, ensure that every time we train a model, 10% of them are success or 10 of them are true, so that it, be, uh, it becomes able to not just predict all of them false. You have a question? I was just thinking in that example, what if you took it during Christmas, you know, the holidays, people are going to buy different things than if you take it, you know, in January, which might even be different than know February so how is your model going to take that into account yeah so uh, this is where like uh, resampling and like uh, multiple techniques like figuring out seasonality and like saying uh, figuring six, six, uh, seasonal trends as in like this product is usually bought between this time so if at this time maybe I shouldn't just like predict all of them true or like that so, but there are multiple ways and multiple techniques for doing that. Would you have access to those as a, in this, you know, in this feature of Salesforce, would you be able to, you know, kind of like do that? It, I, we, I don't think it will be useful if we gave something that doesn't do that. Or like if we even, for our internal uses, we can't just, we have to be able to smartly be able to understand the data resample it or clean it up, transform it in ways that are necessary for the response. Uh, let's say if you have the two competitors who will use this algorithm and they have the same uh, the access to the same data, uh, how will that make a difference? Uh, 
let's say uh, you have two um, uh, company who are selling phones, let's say Apple and uh, Android, and then they have access to the same uh, set of data, then they're going to build their marketing based on, the, uh, on their prediction that's based on your algorithm. How that would work? Oh, so the question was like, let's say we have two companies which are competing and they both have uh, access to the same, let's say, machine learning capabilities that we'll provide. Uh, how is that going to be useful? Well, uh, so I think uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> but uh, how I would see it is like, I think in an ideal world, we want to be able to help our customers have, if they are in part of Salesforce, family, we want th to give them the necessary tools for them to succeed, understand their customers, and be able to figure out who is going to give provide value for them. Um, yeah, I think we have multiple competing customers already in Salesforce, and they use it d in different ways. But as you said, the, the data is important. The models yeah. are important, but the data is. Yeah. And in multi-tenant, you can't share that. We, can't, we don't sh yeah, that's... So the responsibility falls to each customer to own the data. Yeah. And kind of the question arises, you've got on this slide, is that the more data, the better for it to sample. How much is a good level of data that's needed, in your opinion? Mm, I wouldn't... Uh, so the question is like, um, uh, with more data, usually it becomes a better model, like uh, what would be an ideal amount of data to give? So I don't think you can always give a specific number and say a million data points are fine. Usually, the more data, the better, but it's more important to have quality data than just like all whatever data points. Um, so being able to have data which sort of like closely mirrors like the real world situation that you're uh, sort of like trying to predict mm -hmm. is much better than having too much data. And, and the vision is that data would be from your org. It, it will, yeah, you, you will, yeah, else. we don't cross pollinate data. Yeah. You'll be able to use your own data. <laughs> is there any idea that there might be a mechanism where there could be a shared data pool? It would seem to me that all of us have certain data that we wouldn't mm. really care. <laughs> we could share. Yeah. Right, and for access to the pool, we'd share. Is anybody working on that? Uh, yeah, so the question is like, uh, it would seem more advantageous uh, for like to build uh, a common shared pool of data. Uh, so what I've heard is like, uh, there have been, people have talked about it, but at this the point in time right now, I don't, I'm not sure, I can say there are people working on trying to figure out how to um, create a pool, but the, uh, the position right now is like, each org who have it, who are, uh, will be able to build models using their own data. Is there a way to <coughs> measure the model effectiveness? So understand yes, which, which is what we are going to go on next. question is, I, just, to, just to understand what you were talking about earlier, just, I just wanted to make sure that I understand correctly. You said that a, a model that is accurate 99% of the time is not necessarily useful. And my understanding is you're talking about a case where you're trying to predict the exception, right? Yes. But, uh, not, but like not just, uh, so you have to think of it in terms of like, yes, it's 99% for what it has seen so far. Going forward, it might not keep being 99% because, like, it was trained on data which was which had only one exception. So maybe, like, let's say after 500, everything starts being positive. Your model will still be predicting them false, which won't help you. So yeah, then this. Uh, um, so going forward, like, uh, there's stuff that is more like hyperparameter tuning, but like uh, each model is sort of like uh, things that it doesn't learn like a typical case is like in what's called random forest. So random forest is like, uh, imagine a decision tree, but building hundreds of them. So let's say if you build more trees, you're mi most likely going to be able to build a better model. So should like sort of like have ways of you to be able to say, 
I, I want to train ten, 10 trees. I want to tune my data or like my model using specific nodes. So then the final part is like once you have everything worked, you have pulled data, you have done your feature engineering, you have. Uh, quick question going back to the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, so the hyperparameter tuning, yeah. is that something the developers would have access to do it or is this something that sells for? Yeah. So uh, in the case where like this has been uh, provided to a developer, this is like one of the most important things or like one of the more fun things that you can be able to work with as in because like most of after like let's say you've done feature engineering you've gotten like your 75 percent gains you've selected the right model you've gotten like another 10 percent gains the next level of gains comes from being able to tune your uh, doing hyperparameter tuning saying i should train 10 trees i should train 100 i should train 50. so it's sort of like uh, just imagine like the knobs on your stove being able to like tune like what you're cooking to the right temperature. So this would be something that if you're a developer and you want to build a model, you, sh you will be able to sort of like get access to. Yeah. So then, yeah, the final piece is just like model selection. You have, you know, you have done your uh, feature engineering, you've built your models. Now it's just like selecting which model works first, uh, works, works best. And as I, just to reiterate, we build specific models for each client and like if you're a developer that would be something probably that you'd want to do. Then once we have the models you want to have like sort of like uh, model versioning and release management being able to build new models just like how you do like git commits like you push like if like let's say you do use git you push in code if it's bad code be able to like roll back use the best code. So yeah so just a recap like um the final piece is uh, we have feature, which is sort of like how would one envision it and like it will be like a feature extraction. You have a transformation plan. We have like a select a, 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 where you can do model selection. Then you have some way of like writing data to whatever API, some source that you want to be able to save those scores or those predictions. Then sort of like this is like how can we scale this? What we have sort of like worked on is like using Spark, also being able to like allocate resources based on data size. Uh, uh, then also like having some ways of self-healing. And also one thing that we have done which we found really cool is like using bots to do DevOps. We can easily sp spin up like uh, clusters using from like Slack or even like retrain jobs from Slack. I'm not sure, it's sort of like what we've been playing around internally and sort of like it's helped us be able to iterate faster and actually be more productive. So yeah, just a summary. Um, uh, so we have like a sort of like an aut uh, automated machine learning services uh, platform, uh, sort of like built on Spark using Scala, which is like automated ETL and data prep feature which is automated feature engineering which is being able to create features automated model selection for the first case then uh, automated evaluation and saying figuring out which is the best uh, model and like being being able for you to like deploy it into production uh, yeah so like the key takeaway is probably like Einstein will be like a personal data scientist you don't need you uh, like you don't have to worry about ETL you don't need a PhD to be able to do data science. Um, and it's automated so that we will like enable like quick deployment and then design for like easy reuse and like uh, reproducibility. Uh, yeah. So then, yeah, um, for those of you who are curious, there's a new like uh, machine learning app, um, Trailhead, where you can build uh, the predictive vision service. Uh, it's a fun course. Uh, I haven't done it much. I just like went through it and it seems really cool. So if you have time, you can just like uh, be able to create your simple app in like uh, SFDC to recognize and classify uh, images. So yeah, thank you. Wait, could you, could you go back to the oh, sorry. URL? Yeah. I'll, I'll write it on the board no. for you guys. How real time was that for like thousands of hours? So uh, what we are working on is uh, it, it will depend on like the use case. But like what I can say is like for some like uh, what we have done with lead scoring, it's almost real time. But like uh, I can't release it. I think it will depend on the use case and like what you're trying to do. 
But like, I think um, for some probably like, let's say um, you have a case, the more real time being able to say, this is a high priority case and being able to res resurface it fast will be something that's important, yeah. Um, how far away is this functionality from, or in, and also are you considering providing some sort of like a better access? Because I imagine it's such a new field generally that people might want to be able to play with it on uh, dummy data sets even before it's ready to properly be useful for business purposes. Um, I think uh, what we're working on, I think, uh, especially the part where we ex extend it's still more <coughs> thought, but I think it's, uh, I, I'm not sure what the scope of what I'm gonna be working on, but it's, exactly that you have a wizard something like probably like a wizard or like a cli where you just say point data and it, da it builds the first model then gives you like sort of a, a way, some way of doing it i'm not sure i can if before like it's let's say at least dreamforce there'll be some better access but probably once we sort of like have something that's working feasible enough uh, just like we do with everything we'll have like pilot customers or like pilot developers will be able to use it and give us feedback so that we can iterate on it. Yeah. yeah question. Uh, you mentioned about AI models. So how many models are there? Are there different categories? Are there a lot of models? Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, the question is like, how many models are there? So uh, right now, uh, we just like mm, launched uh, lead scoring GA. So each company will have its own model for each use case. <laughs> So let's say you're a company, you sign up, let's say for lead scoring, you sign up for predictive journeys, you sign up for case classification, we'll have models for each one of those cases. So imagine like if hundred thousands of customers who have like hundred thousand models, we already do some of it like um, for some of the pilot customers. Yeah. Yeah. So the features that you've embedded in CRM already, are they models accessible in the way you just described here, or are they kind of more shrink wrapped and just front end? For now, mm, yeah, for the ones that have gone GA, they are shrink wrapped. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, can I sign only in place data scientists? I didn't get your question. Like, can I sign only in place data scientists? Well, well, <laughs> well, if, uh, yeah, the question is like, can uh, Einstein replace data scientists? What I can say is like, if we are successful, we shouldn't have jobs. It was like, you should be able to You'll just, first, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, like, is AI going to replace programmers? Or just the <laughs> powers we've had to solve problems on a higher level? Yeah. If you understand these things, I think you just have a leg up. Uh, I think it's only, I'm not sure it's opportunity. I think it's only lead scoring. That's so that lead scoring and there's the opportunity. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah. So how much of these uh, developer configuration customization is available? Okay, so, yeah, so the question was like for what is going GA, uh, wh how much of like a uh, developer configuration is there? Uh, so right now, um, I think it's all shrink wrapped right now. Because uh, it was built internally, it was still. But uh, w f ideally, what we would want to give, probably once we sort of like have a working basis, maybe we can like unwrap those and allow like even internal admins to build models and like tune whatever. But right now, it's all shrink wrapped. Okay. Is it available for developers? No. No. Oh, uh, for d I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Question. So, <clears throat> number one, like um, this idea of some metadata science, like how much more difficult is it than sort of solving hard coded models? And has this been done before? Or is this something really unique that Salesforce is doing? Um, from my, uh, so the question is like uh, this idea of like metadata science and automation, uh, how much of it is uh, new? So, from my experience, uh, and like uh, f like people who I work with with like data science, like a lot of it we still do 
a lot of like, not, not hard coding per se, but like we have data scientists who are in charge of models and like, uh, so I think there have been like some, uh, uh, some, some initiatives towards automated ML. I know there's a Python library called Teapot, which sort of like does something like that. Uh, but they have like, their use cases are a bit finite. I think so far they only do classification. So you mentioned the versions of the models. Um, what do those look like? Is that some kind of source code that you store in a version control system? Um, it could be something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it, I, ideally, like uh, when um, it would be some source code or like some generated source code, which is compiled and like stored somewhere. I think that's it. Any questions? Thanks. Thank you.